Hi, everyone. How's it going? Ooh, loud. That's good. I'm going to shut this door. I should have set these chairs up in a circle because that's really more of what this is. It's not necessarily me standing up here and you there. It's going to be a lot, a lot more interactive. I don't have any help today with passing microphones, but I know it's okay. It's all right, Roxy. If you guys don't mind me just like picking people and handing it to them, that'll be fine. Because I, I want it to seem less formal. Hey, Michael, can you turn this down just a little bit? Thanks. Um, I want it to have uh, Rebecca Chestnut. Welcome. Good to see you. I wanted this to have, um, I, I want you to feel free right, to share, to talk, to ask questions. What's up, Lewis? Good to see you, man. Uh, long time no see. So um, I will just set it up for us a little bit. And uh, here, Michael, I'm going to put this thing down and use the handheld. It's just easier. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Uh, yeah, one second. You want the other handheld? No, I got it. This one will work. Uh-huh. I'm just going to, one, two, I'm going to use this instead. Um, so when Joe and Betsy sent an email around basically saying, all right, we have the forums lined up all the way to the, close to the end of May, but we don't have someone at the end of May, I said, one thing I've been wanting to do for a long time is um, hear from you all about your thoughts on St. John's. And here I am going off on sabbatical, and I, I want to be thinking about not so much from what I see uh, from the balcony when I look down at, at the life of St. John's, but I'd like to hear about the experience of my parishioners um, on the ground. What are you seeing? What's changing? What are you concerned about? What are you excited about? Uh, those are the kinds of things that um, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from you today. But I, I also know that uh, we don't have a, a ton of opportunities to just interact like this informally, and I know that um, every now and then um, you'll reach out to me and maybe we'll set up a coffee or something like that, but my time is limited, so I can't do that with everyone um, in a week. And so this is just a nice way to do it all at once. And um, so uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to be studying because I know that that's something that's on my mind right now and something that some of you may be curious about. And I'll, I'll share that with you, and then we'll just open it up. And anything you want to know about me and uh, anything you feel like sharing and I'm gonna go back and watch this video. I might take some notes for myself, but go back and watch it so that I can make sure I capture everything. And that's why we're gonna, all questions go through the microphone. Because if you ask a question not in the microphone, it won't show up on the video, right? So I am, um, a few years ago, I started my doctoral uh, studies at Virginia Theological Seminary. Now, I know that sounds fancy. It's not a PhD. Um, this thing's called a Doctorate of Ministry. and a lot of Episcopal priests have this. I'm just a little bit behind the curve. And the reason is that um, I, I started the, uh, the, the doctorate, but then it sparked um, the vision process for me. So I, I actually started the vision process, which is supposed to kind of technically be the thesis that you do at the end. Um, and uh, I um, decided I didn't have time, enough time to do both the vision process and this, so I paused on it. So now I'm going back into it. It is a, it, the, the degree is called a Doctorate of Ministry in Ministry Development. And I just wanted to read to you a quick paragraph description online of what this is. Students in ministry development focus, they focus on the building and strengthening of Christian communities and on the bridge building and connecting of Christian communities with their surrounding neighborhoods, towns, and cities for the sake of common mission, the common good, and a living witness of God's good news. Now, um, I, I don't think any of the other students are doing vision processes like, like we're doing. I just took two things, which is the church's desire when I first got here, the church's desire to be more involved in the community, and I took this opportunity of studying um, uh, some of the uh, statistical sides of things where they were asking us to kind of collect information on the neighborhood and the community and our church, and I said, well, I, I'm kind of an impatient person, so I said, let's just do this thing. Um, so it, it's gonna, this summer is going to be really informative for me in terms of as we think of next steps with the vision, there's going to be a lot of information coming um, and, and uh, resources that I'll hopefully draw on as we continue in that process. The three courses I'm taking uh, this summer are uh, moral and ethical leadership, 
Um, and that just kind of looks at the broad trends of leadership and uh, uh, three books that we're reading. One is called um, uh, Ethical Leadership. One is called, uh, one is the Machiavelli, uh, Machiavelli book, the, the, uh, the Prince. And just really analyzing that. Most of us have read that before. Um, and then there's another one that I haven't started yet, so I don't remember the name of it. Um, a, 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 another class that I'm taking is called um, um, Public Witness and Community Partnership. And this one is all about, do you guys know what AIM is, Action in Montgomery? So it's, it's really close to that in how do you organize with your community. And we've uh, been reading um, uh, so far, I, I'm in the online component. I recently read a book called Toxic Charity, which is an incredible book. You don't usually put those two words together. Uh, the name of the author is Lupton, and um, uh, basically it talks about how in the church's effort to do charity, it can actually completely disempower the communities that it's trying to help. So really amazing things. Um, doing a lot of readings about Martin Luther King. We're reading about um, uh, some of the uh, justice work that's happened in China. So it's like it's a global focus, but then ultimately it's going to bring it down to, and I haven't even started the classes yet. This is all the kind of the pre-reading. Um, it'll bring it down to what is the most faithful way for a congregation, an effective way for a congregation to do community organizing, to make an impact that doesn't just make us feel good about ourselves, that we're doing the good stuff, but it's actually in the best interest of the community. Um, and then the last one that I was interested in taking, there was a few of them uh, that we could choose from, is... Uh, an African-American preacher is going to be t doing this class. I think he comes from a Southern Baptist background or something like that. And it's about how to uh, bring all of your senses into your preaching. I have no idea what to expect with that, with that one. But there's a lot of focus on like, I, I, don't, I don't think you will ever tell that I took this class, right? But there's something about tapping into your body and being aware of your body as you get up and, t and preach and as you're preaching that grounds you somehow. So I have, I, have, I have no idea, but I'm interested in this because I've always wondered how pastors from completely different traditions preach and what do they muster, what resources do, do, do they draw on to do what they do. Um, so those are the three classes I'm taking this summer and that's an intensive three week uh, period in uh, mid June uh, to the beginning of July. So anyway, just a little bit about that. So what are your thoughts? What are your questions? Let's just open it up. Who wants to go first? It's going to be, uh... all right, John. Okay, I'll open with a big one. Um, I'm puzzled why it is that uh, most modern Episcopalians, including our congregation, spend almost no time on the differentiated theology that makes Episcopalians different from other sects. Lutherans know exactly how they differ from the church they left, and Presbyterians and Calvinists know exactly how they differ from us. But we never talk about the 29 Articles, the Chicago Quadrilateral, our founding statements of what we believe. And, and so most of us act as though the Episcopal Church is the church universal, which is a nice thought, but uh, um, you know, not really the way Christianity is. That's a really good question, John. Um, I had a uh, seminary professor who said to me right before I took my general ordination exams, because I did not go to an Episcopal seminary at first. I went to a, one that was a non-denominational seminary called Fuller Theological uh, out in California. And then I came for one year of Anglican studies here. And uh, right before we took our general ordination exams, I said, well, s the answers to these questions are probably the testers are looking for you to answer them with an Episcopal kind of bent, right? So I said, so what, what technically is Episcopal theology? And this was his response. He said, any Episcopalian who has articulated theology, that counts as Episcopal theology. <laughs> I was like, okay. So, and the reason, the reason that is, and you probably know this, John, is that the Episcopalians, we don't have a creed. Do you guys know that? Other denominations have statements of faith or creeds that if you read this and you can affirm it, then you are a part of this denomination. The Episcopal Church doesn't. Obviously, we have the Nicene Creed, which we say on Sundays, um, but we don't have an Episcopal Creed. Like, if you believe X, Y, and Z, then you're one of us. 
And so what connects us to one another, and I'm, I'm going to get back to your question, right? But what connects us to one another is not a statement of faith, but rather it's what we call bonds of affection. So like Episcopalians are connected to one another because of uh, common practice, like we have the liturgy, we use the Book of Common Prayer. You can step into a church in Africa somewhere and you can follow the liturgy because it, it sound, it's like the pieces of it are familiar. Um, and then we have uh, certain uh, conventions and things that, that, uh, that, w that connect us, like Lambeth happens every 10 years, which Episcopalians around the world, Anglicans, go to. Uh, we recognize the, um, uh, the whole episcopacy thing, you know, bishops, and we have these structures. But what really puts us together is that we choose to be in, in relationship with one another. So um, an Episcopal church um, is not bound ju uh, judicially to one another. Uh, we're bound because of affection, like we want to be in relationship with one another. I think that you could go to a different Episcopal church and get someone who is super like Episcopal, like this is what makes us better than everyone else. And um, I have just not, that's not my personality and it's not my theology necessarily. Now I love what the Episcopal church gives me which is a lot of room for mystery. One of the reasons I ended up here is because I got tired of congregations and traditions that are uncomfortable with ambiguity. They have to have an answer for everything. What the Episcopal Church does for me is it says, we don't understand most things, but, but the things we do understand, we put our heart behind. And that's, um, that's kind of where my theology is. But I think, I don't think it's an Episcopal thing. Maybe you have more experience with that. I, I've d definitely been in churches where the Episcopal priest is like, Joe, I don't know what your church was like. Do you spend a lot of time focusing on what makes Episcopalians different than everyone else, or? Next to none. Uh -huh. <laughs> Next to none. Uh, for me, John, uh, the, you have the extremes on one end. This is what we believe. Uh, in like the Roman Catholic, and then you've got the the absolute opposite end of of, of uh, Protestant church, and and we're in the middle, and we always have been. It's not this, and it's not that, but anything in the middle, and it's a great respect for an individual. And and I think that that what Sari said, we're more interested in the questions than the answers, and and if we can grow in better and better questions then we're growing in our faith. All right, Barbara, hold on a second. Hi, uh, Sari, I'd be interested in uh, you reflecting on how your experience at St. John's maybe has changed you or how what it's been like compares with your expectations. I don't really know what I expected when I came here. I, I'm thinking the church, so the, one of the reasons we moved out to this area was because we wanted to be closer to family, right? And um, before I entered into a conversation with St. John's, I was, uh, there two things were happening. One is we were prepared to move to Jerusalem. My, my wife and, and, and my son and I, and we were, it was, everything was in place. And um, we were going to be missionaries from the Diocese of, of, of Los Angeles to the Diocese of Jerusalem. And the reason we called it that is so that I can stay under the umbrella of the L.A. Diocese and not have to shift too much um, in terms of pension and all this kind of stuff. And it was going to be short term, like three years. When that fell through, it was a, a real disappointment to me. I'm really glad it didn't work out. And the reason is that I ended up doing a lot of um, introspective work on why I wanted to move back there. And I think that there was, um, there was a lot of uh, guilt for me and uh, obligation. So guilt of not living there anymore and wanting to go back and just kind of feel connected and obligation because of what my dad does and feeling like, well, it makes sense. I should be the one to go back there and, and keep that stuff going. Um, once I realized that those were the two things, guilt and, and, and obligation, that were really the, behind the heart of it, and that really I was just homesick, like I just kind of wanted to be there, and I didn't need to create these reasons to go over there. 
I, I decided that um, it was probably a good idea to hold off and not do that. So then I was in conversation with the um, bishop in Alabama, and he was going to put me in an inner city church, like really poor church in Ensley in, in, in Birmingham. And that would have looked so different than the church that I'm in now. So I think that I was... Um, I'm, I'm the type of person that when, where, I, where I go, I embrace the situation and, embrace, and, and I become the best that I can be for that particular context. So I, didn't, I, I hope you see, that, you see this, that I didn't, I didn't come and impose preconceived ideas as to what St. John's should be. And I think a lot of priests make that mistake. They'll come into a congregation and within the first year, they start making big changes of what they think the church should be or, or you know, what's, where the altar should sit or you know, all this kind of stuff. And what happens always is that you shortcut the trust building and then people just start hating you because they see you as someone who came and changed the culture. So for me, um, for me I, I felt like when I came here, my job was to just listen and hear where St. John's is. In fact, like the vision process is I believe something that I, I'm listening to what St. John's has been asking for. Um, my expectations when I came here, I knew that this is one of the um, smartest parts of the country in terms of number of PhDs in the household, um, that it was one of the richest parts of our country. And so, and I knew when I first came here that it was one of the most Jewish parts of our country. So I had to ask myself, like, God, why would you bring a Palestinian priest to this very Jewish area? So I, when I first came, I have to tell you, I was open, and it's interesting, only now is this starting to happen. But I said, God, if you have a role for me somehow to play in this area of just bridging um, the divide, I'm open, whatever, whatever you want me to. And so... My expectations of St. John's um, are that St. John's is a very welcoming place to me and my family. I've never felt like you guys expected St. John's to, be, get, to get two for the price of one, like a lot of churches do with your spouse. So Tannery feels totally welcome here to be as involved or uninvolved as she wants to. That's a huge thank you. I mean, I, I really appreciate that about this church. Um, the reason I have no interest in leaving this church uh, at, at any time soon is because I feel like St. John's is really open to growing. I would, I think, feel stifled if I, if I was keep coming up with ideas and the church is like, no, we just want to toe the status quo line. And, and I have not felt that. Like St. John's is willing to grow, really excited about growing. You have faith in me. I really have a lot of faith in us. And so that... Um, it's, it's just been a really beautiful experience being here, but very different had I ended up in the other two scenarios. So, Carl. Um, first, just, just one thing. Um, you, you, had, you had said what excites you and so on and so forth. One of the very simple things that I find so very good is the growth, not just in numbers, but in the fact that there are young more and more young kids. Um, 33 years ago, whatever, when we started coming here, our kids were little and the Sunday school classes were very, very small and it's quite a different story now. I think that's wonderful. Okay, now <laughs> shifting gears a little bit. Um, I, I have not followed the whole DCC process as in any of its details and I'm not gonna ask about details. What I'm wondering is, did we learn anything from that whole experience, maybe something about letting go. I... Let, let me first say, um, let me first say that the first comment you made about the church school growing, I can't take credit for that, and I'll tell you why. I, I really think that there is a momentum that happens once you reach a certain size, and I think that um, regardless of who the rector was here, granted, you would want that person to preach well because parents still look for that, right? They have to sit in church and they listen. I love preaching. I think I've done that. But I think that most of our kids don't pay attention to anything I say. And what I hear from parents is that the, the, the kids are the ones saying to their parents, we want to go back to church. They experience something in our church school. 
So I just want to just give a shout out to uh, Nancy Durr, who's really made that happen. So really amazing. Um, the, uh, the second one, what have we learned? So were we naive in believing that a developer would really want to do um, something that was in the best interest of the church if we stayed if we, if we gave him enough incentives. Um, there were voices that were saying, this guy is not, this guy's only interested in himself, obviously we knew that, and that, um, and that at the end it's gonna be uh, a waste of time and money uh, because we're not gonna get what we, um, what we, we hope we're gonna get. Um, there were those voices, there were other voices on the other aisle basically saying, no, this is the only way pragmatically to really ensure that St. John's doesn't just end up with a wall right next to it. Um, we learned a hard lesson in that the developer pulled out of the negotiations um, at a crucial time, but after he got the support that he wanted for the height of the building. Um, I think it would be easy to be cynical and look at that and say, we told you so. But would I do, any, would I do something different if I could go back not knowing what the outcome was gonna be? I don't, think, I don't think I would do anything different because I really do believe that negotiation is the best way to move forward. Unfortunately, I don't have great things, great opinions about Jaffe. Um, I feel like there's in, uh, some integrity issues that are missing there. Um, so, but, uh, and I don't know much about developers. For me, the big lesson learned is that um, we probably could have done a better job in our relationship with our neighbors in this process. And, and we, what we thought we were doing right, we weren't actually doing well, um, and, and you know some of this, but uh, we were talking initially with the town of Chevy Chase what we didn't realize is the town of Chevy Chase wasn't talking to its residents. And so by the time this became a public thing, the residents were coming to us and saying, why did you never tell us that this was happening? We're just hearing about this for the first time, and so we were kind of caught in the middle. Um, I think we would maybe find another way to make this more visible so that it didn't create the wedge that it has uh, between us and our neighbors. That's the unfortunate piece of this for me. So. Okay, Suzanne. If I can add a segue to that, the process is not over. Until we have a development starting to grow up over there, we, all the knowledge we have attained will be useful, so it's, it's not done yet. But I actually want to um, have an observation also, because your, your, your question was, you know, how, how, are, how are we perceiving where we are in the parish, and I, I've seen great growth in um, social ministries, in adult forums, in many things in the church, but in the actual committees and leadership development that relate to the cogs of the wheels that need to turn to organizationally run this church, there's something uh, missing in the process of co connecting the parishioners from the pew to those groups, they, I see great connection from inviting people from the pew to join the vestry, but not from the pew to join the committees that manage the church. And I think some rethinking of that, both um, on the staff level and on the vestry level, needs to be done. And I would hope that happens. I really appreciate this, Suzanne. Um, One of the um, things that we're, the vestry's working on right now, and I, I wrote an article about this in the Rector's Corner a couple of weeks ago, is that um, churches always start feeling um, the stretch when it comes to their size. And uh, one of the temptations is to look and say, well, we've never had a problem with this. Why all of a sudden do we have a problem with it? Well, there are other variables in here and I, I want to let you guys know, in case you didn't read the article, is that where the vestry is right now is um, we are looking at the size congregation that we fall into, 
And, and we are a lot bigger now than we were seven years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, a lot bigger. In fact, we fall into a completely different category that requires all kinds of adjustments in terms of leadership, staffing, finances, all these kinds of things. And uh, the, uh, one of the symptomatic pieces of this shift is that the lay people are getting less involved because the jobs are getting too big. And uh, the recommendation is that you don't have the leaders of ministry um, start becoming staff members once you r reach a certain point. There's a book that we've been reading that's called um, uh, Inside the Large Congregation by Susan Beaumont where she touches on this very thing. Now, in this process, as we consider growing and how to really infrastructure ourselves, we've been trying to address this need, and that's one of the reasons why um, we hired Ann Dursey. But that is a um, short-term fix, because at the end of the day, you're gonna need more staff oversight over ministries where they're doing the recruiting and it's, it's not just depending on the rector or one individual doing recruiting for all the ministries of the church, but you have staff leaders in charge of ministries that they are doing the recruiting for those ministries. And ultimately, I think that's gonna be the solution to St. John's. But at the same time, you guys need to answer this question for me. Because I have noticed, like Suzanne is saying, less and less parishioner involvement in things. So like when we have gone to ask for volunteers who will be on the vestry, or to be a part of certain ministries, and, and a big one that just stands out in my mind as a big fail in the last, uh, in the years that I've been here, was the OH3 ministry. Do you guys remember that? That was the community care model where we had a bunch of people signing up. We had an amazing um, online sign-up thing where if someone was in need, um, uh, facilitators would reach out and call for uh, volunteers to help with meals or drives, rides, and it ended up to where people in our congregation weren't even signing up. And, uh, and so that whole thing crashed. And so a big dilemma for the leadership, and it's amazing, once you're on the vestry, you start asking these questions. Until you're on the vestry, you're like, oh yeah, we got enough money as a church, or people are volunteering. But once you're on the vestry, you're like, wow, we don't have enough money as a church. And like, where are people? Why aren't they volunteering? So those are the questions that I'm, I'm, question I'm interested in hearing from you. Is it that people in this area are just too busy? Um, is it that uh, being involved in church and, and volunteering in a church is just not meeting a need for you? Is it the church is not offering enough opportunities that are interesting to you? What is that? Um, that is a big question that I have that I, I don't have answered. Um, I don't know if it's like that with all institutions or is it just like that with St. John's? So who, it, if someone has insight into that, I'd love to hear the answer. Um, maybe there's more than one answer. I saw a few hands, so let's go right here. Joe and then Barbara. Uh, thanks, Ari. Uh, I guess just quickly to respond to your comment a moment ago about you know, volunteering and, and involvement. Um, you know, I've been coming to church and my family's been coming to church for several years and it's just been a wonderful experience. Uh, my son, you know, he goes to Children's Chapel and he's now in Sunday school. And I feel that, you know, we get a lot from being here and the culture is wonderful. Uh, you know, the, the issue of being too busy does come up for me, but I also feel uh, a pressure that I put on myself which I'm going to have to deal with at some point, which is I know that I'm taking a lot from St. John's by virtue of having this safe space. And so I think that, you know, from my point of view, St. John's is doing everything that it should be doing and it can be doing to create a space where people want to be involved. Uh, just speaking personally, I, I'm hoping that in the near future with my schedule, um, you know, it would be great to volunteer or find an opportunity. It's, it's, it's busyness, but, you know, that's, everyone's busy, right? We just have to prioritize, and I definitely feel like St. John's, you know, is beyond worthy of being a priority in, in our lives, so. I just wanted to make a, a short comment. Um, in terms of the a program that did not work, 
I'm wondering if it might have been too amorphous and that the new effort to break the neighborhoods down into smaller, more identifiable groups might be the answer. Uh, certainly for me, that has piqued my interest in, uh, in the new program. Um, I was going to say that when I was the parent of church school children, I felt involved and I was connected and it was terrific. Now that I'm, and I was volunteering, I mean I have done a lot of the ministries, but now that I'm an empty nester, that connection seems to not be there because I don't have that regular, yeah, you're nodding, yeah, I don't have that regular see the families every Sunday, do all those activities with youth groups, Sunday school. So somehow now, even though I've been here for many years, I'm floating around, like where do I belong? Um, and not because of lack of interest, but lack of connection, because now as the parish is so much larger, I don't know many people. And I've been trying out all the services, um, just to see maybe there's a connection somewhere, but there is not. So somehow that gets lost when you don't have, I think, when you don't have kids in the program. Well, and sort of piggybacking on that, I think sometimes, too, our, our ask is, is too big or too perhaps amorphous. I know that if you, you know, are more specific, if we're more specific about what we need from people, people step up. And I think, you know, sort of these just join this is sometimes a little hard, but rather kind of getting people in the door to do, I was saying to John, like, bring bagels for this event. You know, if you tell me what you need, I, I can do that. But I, you know, we're all busy. And so to try and figure out the need is sometimes the hardest part. So it's the, it's the unknown of like, just give your time and sign your life away on the dotted line that's like a lot harder than discrete things or very specific tasks. Thank you. Um, that's actually, it's really good to think about. Denise, going back to you, I heard as you were speaking, I'm, I'm hearing that St. John's has a natural, uh, the playground and the church school, a natural connection for parents where they're gonna see one another. I know that's true in neighborhoods, you know, like in my own neighborhood, we have our friends, they all have kids same age. What do people do after they become empty nesters in general to make friends or feel connected? And the reason I ask that is, is there a way that St. John's can tap into the things that actually work and create maybe w avenues of entry again as you redefine your involvement in the church? And what is that? Yeah. Your Tuesday class. Thank you. Um, you know, I tried to find things here that were small groups, so I do EFM, and this is my second year of EFM, but I think your Tuesday class was terrific for that because there were people who I had never seen, they had never seen me, we met at the same table, we were talking about theological issues, yeah, some people are nodding, um, and I think when we left, I then had the family group that I did not get with the Koyania groups, um, as a single person, which were disquieting. Those, so I, I think that Tuesday program brought people together for a finite amount of time. We had structure, there was a, an agenda. You were talking with people who were somewhat like-minded because we had a topic to focus on and it was a very different group of people. And it sounds like I, what worked about that probably was the fact that it wasn't just lecture. It was small group, it was round table conversations and couples couldn't sit at the table with one another. Right? It was every table is just individuals. So if your spouse was there, they were sitting at another table somewhere else. That's really helpful. I'm glad to know that that served that purpose. I know you, you let me know that before, but just to kind of hear it again in the context of this conversation. Um, what else? So, Bill. Uh, so maybe I'll just offer some perspective as a new parishioner. So um, my wife, Lisa, and I are going on, we'll be here for a year uh, by the end of the summer. And I think coming, a couple of things that drew us to the church, I think one was um, a sense of openness. We, we came from a, another church that just didn't seem to be as interested in new folks. You know, the, nobody would catch your eye. There just wasn't the kind of greeting. Um, and the other thing I think was the, and more as, as we were here a little longer, I think it's a very ambitious church. I mean, when you look at all the things you're trying to do, 
the array of things in the bulletins and so forth is impressive. Um, and I would, two things I would suggest in terms of engagement. One is, for instance, my wife and I and our good friends, the Volkers, are going to be helping with the forums in the fall. We would not have done that if you hadn't asked. <laughs> so I think that just simply that direct ask. And I think if we do that more with the program, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that to, to me, that's very key, that you have to have that somebody that you know or somebody that you meet just coming up to you and saying, will you do this? It's that, as someone who's very busy, it's hard for me to say no, right? But it's very easy to not sign up. It's very easy to not sign up, yes. So uh, I think that was the one thing that, and then the other thing I would just think about is so then when you consider that, how many things can we do at once, right? How many, how many, you have a very ambitious agenda, lots of great ideas, but really making sure that we commit and execute on those ideas, and, and how many can we do, so. So, we, so that we don't spread ourselves too thin and not do anything. Thank you, Bill. I'm gonna make a broken record comment. Um, and that is that I, I heard a couple different things in this discussion of how do we volunteer and, and, and what's available. Um, about 10 years ago, probably, we did a time and talent survey. Um, and it was a captive audience. Um, it was an interim um, rector. Um, so he kind of felt free to in, uh, experiment a little bit and, and kind of help us think about what we wanted to be. Um, so from the pulpit, the, and I don't mean to be directive, this is just how it worked. Um, from the pulpit, his sermon was about three minutes on what the paper was in front of us, and then everybody that was sitting in the pew for every service, um, and there was a huge long list of stuff that we need done, and some of it was really big, um, and some of it was really small, like, I can volunteer to bring bagels if you call me on Saturday and I have to bring them on Sunday. Um, so kind of really big and really, really narrow and specific. And then there was also an opportunity for kind of what's missing. So I think what I heard from Denise and maybe Suzanne was nodding was uh, do, do we have an opportunity for a new group, a new ministry, sort of like the um, uh, Felix Aura um, that's aimed at empty nesters, and, and would that be an op opportunity for, for people to get together who don't have kids at home anymore? And so there was a place to kind of fill in a, hey, this is a need that I think the parish has, um, and I'd be willing to step up and fill it, or I'd be willing to help lead it. Um, and that way there's a specific list of things um, to do, and then the leaders of those activities call and specifically, to Joe's point, call and specifically say, hey, you signed up for this. And, 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 and how would you like to participate? Um, it's just a very specific, granular way of knowing what the range of, of activities is, how much investment it's gonna require, and kind of fitting it into your busine busyness schedule. Okay, let me... I, I've heard you on this point, and I really, we're, we're actually thinking on the vision how to incorporate that, because it's an important piece, not just how can you do these ministries, but what in general, what do you do, what are you good at? You know, who do you know? Like just to get a sense of our congregation and the resources that we have here. Um, so I need St. John's to help me become less skeptical about people volunteering, but when we reach out to them, they say they don't have enough time. And I feel um, like there's two problems with this that I can't get over. That if I, if I had the excite, if I knew it was gonna work, I would do it tomorrow. The reason I'm still holding off is because of, again, these painful experiences where people said, I volunteer, I wanna bring meals. And then we burned out the um, leaders who were saying, will you bring a meal? Like, no, I'm too busy. So we ended up with three leaders making like 10 meals, you know, because they couldn't get any volunteers. But that was a clear example of people, there was a lot of energy around it, so I don't know yet what the missing link is in there. And I wanna like, the other thing is, when we say who, like, what are you interested in, people volunteer, but we actually, the implementation question is harder. So like, who's gonna take that off the ground? I can't, you know, I can't like start ministries myself, I definitely don't have time to do that, but under who is that gonna fall? And so, we come back to this question of being uh, understaffed. 
in that all of my staff have too much on their plate and we don't have enough staff. And we can't get more staff until we have more um, pledging. And so it's like all of that plays in. So one of the things we're doing is um, on the vestry talking about how to not just make a big deal out of financial pledging, but again, talk about the importance of time and talent. And, um, and, and how do we basically raise the ante, up the ante a little bit in terms of people feeling like, if like church is about all of us making this happen, it's not just about putting money in the plate and it just being done for us. Uh, it's about us making this happen together. And people complain all the time about not feeling a sense of community right, at St. John's. Well, we're doing all this stuff, but we don't feel community. And kind of the like, the feeling of it is just give us community. Just make it happen for us. And I feel like maybe where the struggle is for St. John's is we're, we're, we, we, we need the spirituality. We're here for that. So Sunday mornings is an amazing morning. But most of us don't have time to make commitments outside of Sunday to, to really get involved. And I, I know I'm not speaking for everyone, um, but if, if every single person at St. John's was involved in some ministry at the church, that would be a dream come true. And I won't ask people to raise their hands in this room, you know, like, what are you involved in? I think maybe half the room would not be involved in much. And so that's the kind of stuff that I want to get to. So would you be interested when we get to that point of like heading uh, time and talent survey? All right, you'll be the first person I come to and we'll make that happen. Uh, you've been here six years? Seven. Seven. And one of the things, I mean, you've done a great job, and, and I think that, that all of us appreciate your leadership. And one of the things that would be important to me as a parishioner is that in your sabbatical, if you would take the time and be able to devote the, the prayer and, and the thought as to how we can help you and how you can help, how you can be a better leader. Uh, and that, that requires sort of peer work or, I mean, is it, uh, there are things, there were things out there when I was a rector, but I don't know if they're still there. But, but, but we have a big investment on you being fresh and you not getting burned out like you talked about others. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if it's money, we've got the money. It's just still in our wallet. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the question of how to get it out there so that we can continue to grow, and that's going to be dependent on you as a leader growing. Does that make sense? It does. And let me just say, like, I want you guys to know, my job satisfaction is through the roof. I love this place. I love working here. You know, like I said earlier, I've I never even entertained the thought of leaving St. John's. And I'll, I'll never forget Penny Winder saying to me one time, because I asked her, um, I said, what, what is in your view the right time for a, a rector to leave their congregation? She said, when, when they peak and the church is just not growing anymore, not in terms of people, but there's just, it's just status quo. That's when you know that it's time to move on. I don't think we're there yet. I think we're mid-process, you know. Um, I definitely don't have a vision of like staying here 20 years. I don't think that's necessarily healthy for a congregation unless like it's just the right fit. But um, my job satisfaction is really high. In terms of money, I believe wholeheartedly that once we as a church reorient our approach to money and we see that um, money, is, money represents a lot of security for us, and it's totally morally neutral, right? So money can be used for good, it can be used for bad. But when we choose to channel our finances in kind of with, with the discipline of a, of a tithe, for example, which I really believe in personally, I think you know that about me. When we do that, we are making a statement about our priorities. And, and when we use it for the church, we, are choo we're, we can rest knowing that our priorities are within the kingdom of God, making investment in the kingdom of God. And if a church is not being faithful with that money, that is a completely different thing, but what we're trying to do is being really faithful with it. And I believe that once our parishioners at St. John's really reorient toward that um, 
uh, proportionate giving, then St. John's can, nothing will be in the way of St. John's making the biggest difference in the world and internally that we want to make. But it, it has to start on the individual level because we're, we don't apply for grants, you know, our money comes from our parishioners. In fact, the Oneness Family School who, that rents space from us and uses it all week long, we have a great relationship with the Oneness Family School, but we cannot let them go. We can't let them go because our operating budget is not self-sustaining. We need the income from them. John Ross calls it golden handcuffs, right? Um, and, and, and it's not because we don't love the school. We think the school is amazing. They've been so good for us. They've been part of our lives for 25 years. Um, but we are limited in terms of what we can do in the future if we want to because we just, we don't have, we can't let go of them. So, um, but like you said, Joe, the money's here, but it's a spiritual thing. It's not just a up here, you know, we have to grow like that. Let me go with Meredith, Joe, and then I'll come back to you. And oh, it's 11 o'clock. Dang, have so much fun. Okay, two more. Okay. <laughs> I agree about the proportional giving and, and everything, but I think part and parcel, particularly as we're talking today, is you know what does it mean to be a member of the church? And I would like the message to go out at the same time that yes, we want your money, but we want your time and talent. And I would love to see a challenge out to the parish at the same time as we talk about money to say, you know, don't care what you do, pick it. You know, your, your obligation, if you want to be a member here, is to do two things during the year at a minimum or something like that. It sounds very strategic and it's something for, it sounds, it's very strategic. It sounds like the vestry, if we can commit to that or something like that without being legalistic, right? That, you know, all right, one last one. Who wants to be the one? Suzanne, you went already. I want to give this to you, but it's someone else who has not gone want to go. Is that okay? Would you mind? Suzanne, thank you. Um, I'm actually very new. I've only been coming for about a month or so, and I wanted to say something about worship. Um, I often look at this from the point of view of my spouse, who is an occasional church goer. He might show up on Christmas and Easter, and one time we had an experience in another Episcopal church where we went on Christmas and he looked at his watch and said, you know, it's been over an hour and I haven't heard anything about the Christmas story. And he wanted to get up and leave. And so one of the first things I noticed here was that service was about an hour and the, your sermon was really great and not too long. And I was thinking about this through my spouse's perspective that I thought, well, he might appreciate a really good short service with wonderful music and preaching. And I really appreciate that about this congregation. We should do this again sometime. This was really fun. I, I appreciate it. God bless everyone. Thank you.